Okay, so that's us recording now, Jenny. And um, I just want to thank you again for agreeing to participate in this interview, which is part of the project uh, charting the history of Scottish pen from 1927 to the present and uh, will hopefully form a useful record of people uh, interested in uh, Scottish Pen's history. So I just have a few questions um, and uh, before we start it might be useful to say a bit about you and um, obviously you're, you'll be known to most people tuning in on these interviews as a very prolific uh, historian of Scottish literature and historian of Scottish history and, and culture. Um, I think you've written 15 books now, is it? Or is it? I'm, you may be right. I'm, I'm really not sure. <laughs> uh, but certainly a well-known figure and, and with a particular literary interest with, you know, books on Naomi Mitchison and Robert Louis Stevenson and um, George Orwell and, and so many other um, important literary figures. Um, but I'd like to just start off by asking you uh, when you joined Scottish Pen and, and why you joined it as well. Well, it was in the 1980s. I'm not sure of the exact year, possibly 1984, something like that. And I joined, well, I was directly approached uh, by Jim Ford, who was president at the time, who kind of accosted me and say, why aren't you a member of Scottish Pen? <laughs> uh, and uh, so that was the, that was the, the, the push. Uh, but of course, um, I, I believed that freedom of expression was absolutely crucial to, to literary survival. So um, it, I, I didn't need to be persuaded to join. Um, and I suppose I felt, and I still feel very much today, that being a writer in a relatively privileged position, uh, that I had a kind of responsibility to be a part of, of, of the, the pen movement. Yeah. yeah, so was it seen as a sort of um, an obligation in certain circles to be sort of, to, to, to sign up to pen and in, in the 1980s in particular as... Uh... <laughs> I'm not sure because I hadn't, I'd been aware of it, but only kind of marginally aware of it. And I didn't know at the time that I joined, uh, I didn't know, I didn't know that some of the people I knew were members of PEN, right. put it that way. Uh, so it felt like joining uh, uh, something that was quite unknown to me. And I, I, I really didn't know a lot about it and I suspect uh, that that has been the same for uh, a, a lot of people that uh, they've they they join they they may may be vaguely aware uh, that there is uh, an organization called PEN um, mm -hmm. but they're not sure what it's about uh, and they just need that little extra bit of information or personal connection Yes. So w once you joined, I mean, what what were the kind of events and activities and the issues that you were then um, kind of engaged with in that period in, in the 1980s? I wasn't much involved in the 1980s. I went to uh, I went to some of the meetings. Um, there were uh, in those days was quite a lot of emphasis on kind of social occasions which was uh which was nice it was a way of getting to know people um i really didn't get seriously involved until the 90s when i joined the committee and again i'm afraid i can't remember exactly when that was uh, there'll be a there'll be a document somewhere which will which will uh, uh which will say when i first joined the committee um and then, at that time, I was uh, I was in in, a, in full time employment, so it was a there was a limit to the, to the amount of time that I could do with that. Um, and I suppose I began to get more involved in the approach to the 1997 
uh, Congress, which was hosted by Scottish Ben in, in, in Edinburgh. Um, and I, that, 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 that got me more involved. Uh, that was a huge, a huge task. Um, because in those days, uh, we were 100% dependent on, on volunteers. Right. Um, so that was that. That was a that was a a major milestone, I think, in in in, in Scottish Pen's evolution. Um, I was a member of the committee by then, and then uh, Paul Scott, Paul Henderson Scott, was uh, president, um, and he and uh, his partner, later wife, Laura Fiorentini, and Mary Baxter, who was a, um, a, a previous president, um, they, the whole thing couldn't have happened without the three of them. They put right. huge, huge effort into that. And then I gradually uh, got more, more involved. I got, um, we, we revived the uh, Women Writers Committee um, myself and Faith Pullen, who was a, a committee member for a while, um, and that was, in some ways, that's that was one of the most rewarding um, activities that I got involved in. We we worked with the University of Edinburgh and set up annual events to mark um, International Women's Day. And uh, they were they were really interesting. They were they were very rewarding to to organise. Uh, they brought together um, some really interesting writers, and the events themselves were hugely stimulating. Um, so that was that was a good that that was a good period of the, those several years when we were working with the University of Edinburgh. Um, that was something I wanted to ask you about. Was was the the role of women because I've been looking at the the early days obviously I've been kind of focusing on the the 20s and the 30s and it's quite clear that there were quite a few quite um influential women even in those early days of pen in the, in terms of setting up both Scottish pen people like Helen Crookshank and yes um Margaret Sackville and uh, and of course, Lady Dawson Scott, who who was one of the founders of Penn International, um, and yet sometimes it does feel as though, in terms of the events themselves and some of the debates, women are a little bit marginal um, in in the records anyway. And I, and it's interesting that you you um, specifically set up your own kind of events and and almost subcommittee. It sounds like in in the nineties. Um, so you felt there was a need to to kind of shine a light on on women writers and and kind of related issues for that reason. Yeah. Yes, I I should say. Well, first of all, of course, the, the Pen International or International Pen, as it was, was then, they had a, a a women writers committee, and uh, Faith and I weren't the initiators of the Scottish Pen Committee. Uh, that had been um, put together in, again, sometime in the 90s. Um, I, should, uh, I should have a date at my fingertips, but I don't. Um, and uh, that initial committee um, devised the Scottish Women Writers poster, which featured 100 Scottish women writers many of whom were partly, if not entirely forgotten. Mm. Um, and that was a really interesting project and, um, and, and attracted quite a lot of attention, which was good. Mm. That initial committee, for complicated reasons, which I won't go into, uh, kind of faded. Um, so you sort of and, revived it, as it were, with, with Faith. And, it, and Faith, Faith and I revived it. Um, I mean, it, it didn't disappear altogether. There were still women writers' events, um, but they tend—they were on a very modest. They were on a very modest scale. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and um, and uh, partly because Faith, uh, at the time she was um, at the University of Edinburgh, so she had some very useful connections, yeah. um, uh, and the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities um, were uh, interested in getting involved. Um, which was which was a big help because they partially funded the events and provided a um, a venue and um, and had all kinds of uh, useful connections. Um, so that that was that that was very worthwhile. And it's one of the one of the things that I just on a personal level I enjoyed most and felt I got most out of. Mm. Um, and did that then feed into the? 1997 Congress. Uh, I was interested to hear a little bit more about that Congress and did that feature sort of specific women's events with, within the well, program? Or? It, di- it did, although um, our revival of the of the Women Writers Committee came after that. Oh, but okay. there, there was, in fact, there, there was one event on women writers which I took part in uh, at the 1997 Congress and I can't remember all the others who were there, um, but there was uh, there was at least one specific women writers event, yeah. um, and of course, at normally at Congress, each of the different groups um, have have their own their own meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, so um yes i mean in in uh, as as far as pen international was concerned uh there has for for quite some time been um a, quite a strong effort to uh give more space to women writers and some of the women on the pen international women writers committee have been um pretty pretty strong voices, I have to say. Um, So what are your memories of the 1997 Congress? I mean, was it a great success? Well, it it was... What what were the hot hot issues of the Congress? Well, I wasn't 100% involved because I was was still working at the time. And so I I took a couple of days off and uh, I... (laughs) My my main role was um, apart from the event that I took part in. My main role was um, meeting people at the airport, right, and okay. ferrying them to Pollock halls. Okay. <laughs> um, but it was like like all congresses. There is such um, there is such a buzz simply from the fact that writers from so many different parts of the world are getting together uh, and you have the opportunity to meet um, all kinds of people Um, and you also get an insight into um, what's the best way of describing it a kind of uh, all the backroom stuff that is going on the gossip the 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 gossip and the um, the personalities who are well known in Penn International circles and uh, for good and perhaps not so good reasons. The, the troublemakers. The, uh, They're always the interesting ones. Yeah. And it was, it, it, it's, it's such a, a kind of um, cauldron of different interests and sometimes conflicting interests. And, you know, the, 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 the debates can be extremely heated yeah. um, and as I say there were certain personalities who were who, who were known to be you know rather fiery and um, subversive. Yeah that brings me to one of my other questions because there's this you know the, the central um, I suppose the founding understanding of Penn is this concept of friendly cooperation isn't it between writers and that that Penn is is not a political organization. It's not a, a, 
a campaigning organization in a, in a specifically political um, direction. And, and yet politics is always often very much on the agenda. And I'm very interested in this tension and how it might play out, particularly in the Congress when people from, from diverse cultures and opinions um, come, come together to discuss things. So how, how do you think PEN as an organization and, and specifically, I suppose, Scottish PEN manages that tension and, and is able to maintain that sense of friendliness, which sort of ideally transcends the, the specific political allegiances of members? Is that, does that, that, is that tested? in these kind of um, congress? Oh, yes, yes, I think it is. And, and while I'm interested, just to sort of go back historically to the, f the, the setting up of Scottish Pen, mm. it, was, it, it was resisted mm. because it, Scotland was not seen as uh, being a nation with an identity that should have its own centre. Mm. Um, and gradually the, the 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 idea that that pen centers could be well for example uh, a yiddish center was founded well it's clearly not linked with any particular nation it's mm. it's not a national identity it's mm. uh, it's a linguistic identity um, and you get the same um, with uh, some with some other groups uh, and then, of course, Gallic section wasn't there was a Gallic section within the Scottish. Uh, pen. Yes, yes. Um, so, Penn has had to be very accommodating, uh, but inevitably there are all kinds of of conflicts. There was there there can be huge debates um, on a whole range of issues, you know, whether wh whether a particular group should have a separate identity as a pen center and, mm. uh, and, and this kind of thing. And it becomes very tricky when it, when it comes to uh, exiled writers. So you get Chinese writers in exile and Cuban writers in exile and, and that, that kind of thing. And sometimes, uh, sometimes there's two groups um, from with, with, with apparently the same identity but but are in fact very different mm. and is it it's it often seems to be um that, that some of the, the tension revolves around the right of of a writer of of any you know individual writer to to say to have the freedom to to write and say what they they think um as and, and to defend that as opposed so it's the right to speak and write as opposed to the right to to speak and write a particular content i suppose is that the, the distinction that that it's about defending that 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 kind of freedom to to commit to to writing or, or to speak um rather than what is spoken um, or is it more complex than that? I think it's more complex than that. I mean, broadly, it is that. But then there is, as all defenders, well, most defenders of freedom of expression will, will say, it, 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 it's, it's a right that has to be handled responsibly. Mm. Um, and so you do have to call out the misuse uh, the damaging use of freedom of expression, and there's no, there, there is no, we, we know now, you know, more than ever, uh, that uh, allowing people to say whatever they think in an irresponsible way can be extremely damaging, and and both to individuals and and politically and in all kinds of ways, uh, and that's that's a real challenge for Penn now, I think, mm. to 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 be quite nuanced in the way. Uh, these things are, are characterized. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's some, something that I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on to, tomorrow in the symposium because it's such a, a, an ongoing and, um, you know, um, pressing issue, isn't it? In terms Absolutely, of the current, yes. The current debates about, about freedom of speech. Um, but 
I also just going back to you know you referred to the early days of Penn and and I wondered what your thoughts were on on really what you could see as being distinctive about Scottish Penn and obviously it has a distinctive history does it also have an identity that's um, specific to its Scottish cultural and historical context. I mean, obviously, it's part of an international relation. Um, but does it does it have some? Is there something you know specifically Scottish about Scottish pen that that we can sort of think about or identify? I I think it does. I mean, if you go back to the early days, I mean, Scottish pen was shaped its identity was shaped by those writers who got the whole thing started mm. um, and you, know, you get somebody like like um, like McDermott for example you get the, those hugely sort of towering personalities were hugely influential of course they stamped the identity of the organization and I think that's always been the case but it was especially so in the early days it may and probably especially important in the early days um, it, and if you look at for example the first congress in 1930 94. whenever it was uh, 34, um, yeah. 1934 um, and look at some of the material that was that was issued around that it was all about um, promoting uh, an understanding of Scottish literature and Scottish culture and what Scotland was all about. I mean, it was seen as a platform for um, for for doing that. And 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 the same uh, has been true of the other two congresses. Mm. Um, and of course, every every nation that hosts a pen congress does the same. Mm. And it's as they should. Mm. Um, you're you're seeing literature internationally in in a particular national context uh, and and that's what's one of the things that's so important about congress that are moving around from from country to country there have been relatively a relatively large number of congresses in scotland haven't there given the size of the the country um there's there's been three haven't there so yes 450 and and 97 so that does speak of a certain kind of ambition, doesn't it, um, to to showcase uh, Scottish. Uh, I'm struck as well that, um, and I don't know if this is typical of, of pen in general, but it seems to have started off as a very literary pen, you know, the, so the figures associated with it were, were people like McDermott and Helen Cruikshank and, and, and others who were quite literary as opposed to journalistic or historical writers. Um, do you think that's, I mean, has that always been very strong in Scottish pen? I think it probably has, although there have been, um, there have been, William Power, I think, was yes. more of a journalist than a, yes. than a, mm. uh, than a, a, a writer. <laughs> um, I think we are now, or in, in recent decades, we have been so much more aware of threats to journalists. Mm. That the role of pen in, in in protecting journalists has become more and more important, and is you know arguably now is is more important than 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 mm -hmm. ever. Um, but something that's happened here, and and I know it's happened in other countries, and it, and I think, I mean, it's interesting the way the that pen membership varies from country to country, but. Here, I mean, since since I've been involved, when I joined Penn, I had to apply. Right. I had to make my um, I had to make a case. Mm. Uh, you know, I am I am a writer, and this is what I've done, yeah. and I've published mm. X number of books, <clears throat> and so you know, I'm eligible for membership. Mm. Um, and that was still the case until relatively recently, mm. and and we've gradually opened membership up, mm. and now basically anybody can join. Uh -huh. So because uh, I can, noticed, I noticed in the constitution from 1927 
there was a few sentences about membership and it was a bit like a gentleman's club so you had to be yes. nominated from someone inside the club and you had to I that, say, yes establish, yes establish your credentials and be yes. accepted. um but it, it's now as you're suggesting much more um much more open and and probably more diverse i suppose that that's part of part, part of the aim of that as well isn't it to diversify membership and um so yes, and and to attract to attract younger members, to mm -hmm. attract uh, who who may or may not turn out to be writers, um, or may just be beginning to may have you know not not mm -hmm. a, a particular reputation if they've just you know maybe published one book or uh, mm -hmm. a few poems or, or 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 something. And I think it's important part of Scottish Pen's role is to encourage and promote. Scottish writing mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you can't do that if you're limiting your membership to those who are already established part of that establishment yeah um, but there are and there are many other countries who are doing when, when we first started to talk about opening up the membership we looked at uh, places like Australia and Canada mm -hmm. um, um, United States too I think uh, places where membership is open to anybody who subscribes to the basic aims of of, 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 of pen um, mm. there's always been an argument of you know how do you how do you know somebody maybe somebody wants to infiltrate the organization and uh, um, but uh, I think that's a minimal risk uh, and I think it's a minimal risk that you just have to be prepared to take mm -hmm. yeah yeah and so in terms of membership who, who do you think have been the sort of shaping figures of Scottish pen. I mean, you mentioned McDermott, obviously is um, well known as as the the or certainly one of the founding um, figures. Uh, but in terms of you know good and bad, I suppose influence on the organisation. Um, who who would you sort of point to as being particularly influential? Well, I think several of those founding members. I mean, Hel Helen Crookshank. Mm. I think was really important. Um, she she seemed to hold things together mm -hmm. uh, for a period of uh, 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 of years. And am I right um, in thinking? Because I was looking at um, the the sort of lines of succession. It, it looks as though she sort of directly took over from McDermott when he resigned in I think it was 1929. He didn't last very long, did he? Um, and it looked as though she sort of stepped into his role as a sort of almost like a calming, <laughs> calming figure. Yes. Um, yes. She 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 had very much a sort of nurturing role, I think, in 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 the literary environment generally. Um, and I think I mean I don't I haven't gone into this in any detail, uh, but I suspect that as you say I think she really kind of held things held things together. Mm -hmm. um, and she also helped a lot of individual writers, but right. uh, um, mm. but yes, I mean, I, I definitely think she, she her role should not be underestimated, um, and in terms of pen, um, generally, um, there's a, a whole period. I don't really know a great deal about. I suppose the period sort of wartime after the mm -hmm. after the Second World War, um, and when I came uh, to be involved in Penn, um, as I, I say, I'm Paul Scott was um, partly because he had so many useful connections and very useful experience uh, as a diplomat. Um, and uh, he was the, the linchpin of the 1997 um, Congress. But every, in my experience, every president has brought something particular mm. and valuable. Um, to the organization and with with different interests and diff different emphasis during during their presidency but again that really is as it should be the important thing is and i i think the i think the last 
10, 20 years have demonstrated this, the important thing is for each successive president maybe to take things in a slightly different direction, but to build on mm. what has gone before, not to, not to jettison it, not to abandon mm. um, uh, what has gone before. Um, and I think without that, without that sense of, of gradually building, expanding, um, becoming more ambitious, mm. uh, the organization would just kind of be treading water. It wouldn't really be, have a great deal to contribute. Yeah, yeah. And, and as you said before, with that has to be that sense of enge always engaging the next generation, isn't it? That seems to be crucial to, to, the, to the perpetuation on the, of the energy that, that kind of makes Penn significant, makes it a kind of um, notable organization in terms of its influence. I think that's right. And of course, um, what has been kind of almost revolutionary in our development has been starting from uh, Tessa Ransford's presidency, or really actually starting before that, but just naming a particular milestone. Mm. T Tessa uh, got our office for us. Okay. Mm. And a room that, of our own, as it were. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it made so much difference. Even, I mean, it's a tiny office. Um, and it's, uh, of course, we need a, we, we really do need somewhere a bit more substantial. But, but having an office, having an address, mm. um, having that kind of identity of location uh, was a huge step forward, just psychologically as well as in, in terms of promoting Scotland's presence. Uh, Scottish Pen's presence. Um, that was, and and it's really from that moment, the next step was getting funding to um, employ staff, mm. and gradually um, we've be built on that. And I have to say that um, we've had some fantastic uh, part-time staff who've done a huge amount to uh, ex expand our activities and um, just generally uh, promote our involvement in mm. that, all kinds of really, really crucial issues like the whole defamation uh, yeah. Ca campaign. Yeah. And um, I mean, the campaigns are obviously incredibly important, uh, but I was interested that you mentioned um, previously about the importance of the social aspect of Pen and does that is that easy still to continue? Are there still social events um, to promote the the kind of I suppose the fre the friendliness between writers? Then are there still those opportunities? Um, well, there was, there was yes. a certain amount of I, I noticed there was a there was a speech by it was H. G. Wells in in the thirties, and he said, you know, it's, it would be terrible if Pen just became a social club and you know, there's all this politics going on but although the social you know the social d dimension is also important um does that still happen well that is that's a, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question because what has happened is a diminishing of that aspect mm. um as i said when i joined there were well we had an annual um New Year get together, for example. Mm. Um, Mary Baxter, who was a really important figure in Penn, in Scottish Penn, for so many years, she used to host parties uh, at at her house, um, and uh, the last social event I think. I think, uh, I can't remember the year, uh, but it was hosted by uh, Bashaby Fraser, who is mm. one of our trustees, uh, in her home. Um, and it was, that was lovely. I mean, that was, I don't know, probably 10 years ago. Mm. Um, and every now and again, 
there would be a complaint from, especially from, you know, maybe some of the older members saying, why, are, why isn't Scottish Pen doing this anymore? Yeah. Mm. And the, 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 the reason it was, is um, we're doing so many other things. Mm. Uh, who's going to uh, take the time and, the, and have the energy to, to organize yeah. uh, a purely social event? Yeah. It also sounds as though it was quite, even historically as well, you, I was always reading about people having an at home um, and it, so it's relying on people having a home and opening it up or, or else maybe taking money from the, the budget of the organization, which people might argue, you know, might, might be better spent on a campaign for this or that. And so there's always that kind of um, pressure, isn't there, on, on funding. Well, that's, that's right. And I have, to, I have to admit, I did sometimes get um, mildly irritated with one or two people who, who kind of harped on uh, about this. And, and I, fi I find myself saying, well, you know, it would be absolutely great to have a social event. Why don't you organize one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and of course, that didn't happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. But having said that, um, in, in a sense, all of our events are social events. Mm, because mm. all of our events bring people together and there's always an opportunity to talk and very often to talk over a glass of wine or, or, or whatever. So um, it, it's not as if we're, you know, we're absolutely um, undiverted from yes, yes. You know, the serious business of, yeah. of, of, oh. of, of supporting writers. Uh, and of course, uh, social events are a way of supporting writers. And yeah. it, that, that, it, it is important. But um, I, I wouldn't like anyone to think that there is no opportunity for writers in Scotland to get together through Scottish Pen, because there are, there are loads of opportunities. Yeah, and I imagine even if there were social events they would you know the the conversation would would not be devoid of uh political and current issues uh, in any case so there's always uh, a gathering of writers is always going to be productive isn't it in any in any context or whatever the well absolutely the premise. Yeah. yeah um so i i just wanted to sort of i suppose come to a, a conclusion by by thinking about the future um almost inevitably and um ask you what you think are the sort of future risks but also maybe opportunities for Scottish pen um, obviously we're in a very um, you know concerning uh, political and and social and and medical situation currently but what, what do you see as the kind of um, the, the as I say the opportunities but maybe the dangers for the organization as we um as we look at what lies ahead of us in a way uh there are too many opportunities in in the sense that there are too many uh areas where we could should uh have a role um and I think that is one of the the challenges for us is to accept that we can't do everything. Mm. What's the most important thing to focus on, which might change from, yeah. I was going to say year to year, but from day to day. Um, I think it's important for us to be in a position to react quickly uh, when something comes up that is seriously urgent. Mm. And I think we're pretty good at doing that. Our, our Writers at Risk Committee is, uh, is pretty pretty nimble, uh, and and in the way it it's can respond uh, mm. to well, you know, for example, the situation in Belarus. Mm. Um, so I think we're I think that's one of our strong points, mm. and I think it's important that we should um, build on our strong points and and make sure that we we keep that mm. aspect of our activities going. Um, in the last few years, we've done quite a lot in working, well, quite a lot. We've had a, a big focus on working with um, marginal communities. Uh, and I think- within, proved, within Scotland or? Within Scotland, yes. Um, and I think that uh, we've, we've built up good uh, 
good experience in that and i i would like to see that continue mm. but that kind of activity is totally dependent on additional funding and as for so much of what we do i mean we we we, we need outside funding to afford staff mm. Mm. um and that's our biggest challenge mm. um fundraising yeah uh and and, and it's what form does the fundraising take currently? Well, a lot in uh, in recent years, a lot of what we've done um, has been funded through uh, Creative Scotland. Mm. Um, but our most recent applications have not been successful. Mm. And I think there is a feeling uh, that Creative Scotland feel well you know we've given them quite a lot really you know they they need to look elsewhere for for mm. for uh, for support um, the Roundtree uh, funding for the whole defamation project has been really important to us mm. um, and that is um, that and that is continuing uh, for another year I think I'm sure somebody will be able to tell you exactly um uh, what the situation is there um so it's diversifying funding is is going to be the challenge uh, yeah uh, absolutely and you know we've had um numerous unsuccessful mm. goes and of course it's hugely time consuming yes uh and uh it's sometimes difficult to keep up the, the 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 commitment and the enthusiasm when you're being knocked back mm. um so i think i think without a doubt that is the biggest the biggest challenge and but you know underpinning that is the challenge of involving individuals who are prepared to put the effort in to uh and and you know we're very fortunate in the board that we have at the moment because um there are people with the right experience um, and, and the, the time and the time. energy to, mm. to, to, to do that. Mm. Um, but it does tend to mean, and this is, I know, true of many organizations, many voluntary organizations, that you know, they, uh, the members of the board, the average age tends to be, mm -hmm. um, you know, they tend to be people who are retired, who just, or, uh, have that have reached a point in their professional careers where they can give time to pen and the mm. younger people it's very hard for younger people to 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 do that mm. um and i think we're particularly appreciative of the younger members of the board um those who are not just in full-time jobs but in very full-time jobs mm. um, who are who are prepared and able to give give time yeah yeah um well that's that's absolutely been fascinating um thank you very much for for uh your thoughts and and your recollections uh jenny and um i'm sure people are going to be really these are going to be very valuable resources to people in the future when we're thinking about the the history of of scottish pen so we look forward to um seeing you tomorrow at the symposium yes um hopefully have another chance unfortunately we're having less of a like a social event tomorrow than we had <laughs> because of the uh the, the dreaded covid but um but nonetheless i hope we'll we'll be able to to chat in a congenial context then as well so um it's been lovely to meet you this first time we've met but uh, yes uh, yeah I, well yes really really nice yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, so I'm sure you have lots of other things uh, to do with your time today. So I'll I'll let well, you. Well, I need to take the dog for a walk. Oh, me too. <laughs> yeah. uh, so thank you very much, and uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Right, lovely. Thank you, Helen. Bye now. Bye.